This is a Gradowski of WeAreChange.org here outside the headquarters of Mines. And as you've been probably watching our videos and understanding that social media is creating a conundrum for humanity that humanity has never faced or ever dealt with. And to talk about that plus a lot more, we have Tim Poole of Tincast, an independent journalist. You, of course, saw him on the Joe Rogan Experiment talking to Jack Dorsey himself, bringing up very important issues. And... Uh, do you think anything happened because of that? Do you think there was any ramifications? I think I think it was good. I still have to give pr uh, props to Jack Dorsey. He's one of the few CEOs to actually face the music. The music's disgusting, by the way. The music's dirty. The music's uh, not only making your ears bleed, it's making people go crazy, literally. Uh, but at least he's listening to the music somehow. But it's pointless. It's pointless, yeah. Tim, Tim. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if Jack Dorsey can actually do anything. I'm assuming he's a figurehead. There are, he got fired a while back. My understanding is he got fired. I could be wrong. Then they replaced him with Dick Costolo, who I guess he got fired or resigned. Jack came back. I think Jack's a figurehead. You know, I can sit down in front of the guy and explain to him the problems. And the problems I talked about were only a few of the real problems. And nothing gets done. They were banning people for saying to learn to code. They still ban people for saying learn to code. If you can't tell the CEO to his face, stop doing this and have him, and then even when he not acknowledges it, they don't fix it. But you know what, man? It's not, it's not so much just about censorship. That's a big problem, too. It's about the fact that Twitter's known for a long time that the way retweets work, the way your follower count works, it's gamifying the social experience. Experience, And people then try to get their hot take. They want, they want to tag Luke and say, you conspiracy wingnut, blah, blah, blah. They want to be as mean as possible to get as many shares and likes. So they get those numbers, and that makes them feel good like they're playing a video game. We know this is the problem. Instagram has the same problem. Facebook has the problem. And what does anyone do about it? Two things happen. Big business forms around it, exploiting it and making money off of it. And the other thing that happens is it generates an ideology, a, a weird net of extremes that are pointed at each other, saying the craziest things, getting crazier and crazier. And now, and, and, and now what world do we live in? You know, science is being completely denied. And are, are we're looking at, you know, for those of you who are, who are ever left-leaning, the Democratic Party is... I've, I've posted uh, chart after chart showing how insane they've gone because of social, it's partly because of social media. Yeah, I mean, there's other points that other people bring up, and I believe you brought this up too, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you ever wanted to destroy uh, left-wing political ideology, all you do have to do is follow the blueprint that's happening right now on social media. And I remember seeing a tweet. That's Zuby. Yeah, Zuby. Zuby, the rapper. Zuby, Zuby said that earlier. He said, if, if, if you ever want to convince someone to be right-wing, just have them follow some left-wing people on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, there's a famous quote I saw on Twitter that said, if if you're famous on Twitter, it's like being at the popular ta table at a mental ward <laughs> during, during school lunch. That's literally what it is. You go in there and it's like civil war. It's conflict. It's hyperbolic nonsense, anger, uh, just extreme lies. hyperbolic, bipartisan. Yeah, lies, propaganda, disinformation. They need to make an enemy out of someone to step above someone to empower themselves. And it's disgusting and it's empowered by social media. It's incentivized. It's monetized. And again, they're skewing the game. So so their click, their gang gets all the power from it. But it's not power, it's absolute mental derangement that's happening because of it. It's, it's dominoes falling over, yeah. right? So when, when Twitter comes out and says, maybe we should get rid of the retweet count, maybe we should get rid of the follower count, that was years ago. They know why they need to do it. They are, they are, they are creating an addiction. It's a, digital, it's a digital drug where people feel good when they get those numbers. And Twitter says, but we're making money, we're growing. If you get rid of those numbers, Nobody's going to use Twitter anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's a dopamine hit. Many psychologists, many scientists have even looked into the addictive effects of social media. You specifically look at the way social media acts. It's uh, directly correlated with the gambling industry and using ma many psychological tricks of the gambling industry to get you hooked, to get you addicted. And this could be, I believe, one of the reasons, I believe also your gut, we talked about that before, but I believe one of the reasons why, especially teenagers and young adolescents are more depressed than ever, more anxious than ever, committing suicide more than ever because of this high hyperbolic, power-grabbing, new sensationalized infotainment uh, click tits that have been, you know, just smeared all across your face being like, yes, the more you insult someone, the more likes you get, the more hearts you get, the more, oh, what's the new word when someone gets more replies than hearts? What is that thing? Oh, uh, ratioing? Ratio. Oh, you got ratioed. Oh, you got ratioed. Like, like it's a big ego fest and, it, and, and you've been dealing with it. You've been working out. I, I got to admit, uh, me and Tim, we have our political differences, but he's one of the most hard-working individuals out there. I never seen 
seen someone work as hard as Tim does. Being honest with you, he deserves what he gets. He's he's doing really good. Uh, he's on top of the algorithm. He's kicking butt. He knows what he's doing. Uh, so congratulations on that. Keep doing it, man. Because uh, you know, uh, what do you say to those people though who accuse you of doing the same things that you speak out against? Against you know the kind of uh, sensationalism or hyperbolics. How do you respond to criticism of your work? If so, most people when they look at my YouTube. They, they're like, oh wow, the, the only real criticism I get is that it's conservative, right? Not that it's extreme or anything, it's not. The headlines are actually kind of tepid. And if you watch the videos, my opinions are always rather tepid. And that's kind of the point, right? I'm a rather moderate individual, I lean left, but the left has gone off the deep end. So typically the people who say that I'm, you know, you know, catering to an audience or trying to produce content, it's because they're usually on the left. Moderates are like, Tim, you do really great work, I appreciate it. And a lot of people who used to be, you know, aligned with being liberal. But I will also say, anybody who thinks they're immune to social pressures and these and these formulas is lying to you. So I think I think if you were to look through my content, you'd probably see the content slowly being more and more focused. And I recognize, you know, I, I see that. I I look at my content and I'm like. I feel like I'm covering these important things and trying to pull people back from insanity. And there are a lot of people who do that. But I think what's happening is, as these social media companies censor the right, they end up leaving nothing but the mainstream, like straight-laced, you know, suit-wearing right. But the left is free, has free reign, for the most part. The anti-war left gets, gets the boot a lot too. And what, that, what ends up happening is, like Zuby said, if you want to make someone conservative, have them follow the left. Because Sarah Jung, Right? Do you know what you know? She was she was the racist woman for three years. Posted racist things on Twitter. She gets a job at the New York Times. They run wild with it. So I'll say this: It's harder to radicalize or to drift into that problem of producing more and more extreme content on YouTube because I don't know what YouTube will promote. I, I don't. Like over time, you're kind of like, hey, that video did well. Maybe I should do something like that. But with Facebook, you get shares. With with Twitter, you get retweets immediately. You can see the immediate results, and you can see it rapidly expanding fast, and people chase after that. But more importantly, I'm an individual. I talk about what I think is important. So a lot of a lot of the videos I make are just based around what I'm focused on, and it's usually because Antifa has attacked me in the past, sent me death threats, and then it creates kind of a cascade where the more I make that kind of content, the more they, they point at me, the more they threaten me, and so then my focus is drawn to them. With these companies, like Mike.com, we saw that story from the outline, where they actually give their employees a formula and say, here's how you make rage bait. Here's how you manipulate people into clicking. That's not something I'm aware of because I just make things I want to talk about. And again, my opinions are actually kind of tepid. But anybody who knows me, they call me a milk toast fence sitter. So to accuse me of that, it's kind of like, dude, watch my video. Yeah. But those companies have formulized yeah. how to manipulate with rage. Yeah. If anything, I would say pragmatic and uh, devil's advocate uh, more than anything else. That's one way of kind of I would personally describe it. But you know, we've known each other for years. We uh, worked in many crazy situations, from Fukushima to riot zones to Ferguson to Baltimore. We've been all over the place. And uh, you know, I mean, you're doing you're doing a great work. You just got to keep it up. You're gonna you just announced you're gonna be changing it up, which I'm really excited about because there is an aspect of this that is draining. Uh, and I, it kind of leads me into the next question: Is there a solution? Is there an answer to the kind of proverbial train wreck that we are headed in right now because it looks psychologically, mentally, social, sociologically, we're headed towards a train wreck because of social media. Is there an answer? I don't know, I'll say, I don't know if there's an answer, but let me say this. Maybe. It's not that it's draining, right? I'm, I, I announced that I'm going to change up my content and focus more on travel. I have a van, a production van being built that I can travel around in. I'm still going to be doing an hour of content on my second channel. I hope that's not too loud. Is it too loud? All right, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to wait. We'll wait just a little bit here as the ambulance passes by. I'm gonna see how good these microphones are. If you guys could still hear me, we're here in the live streets of Connecticut, unedited. So so here's the thing. I sat down across the table from Jack Dorsey, and I said, "Here are some really big problems with your platform. It's it, it's radicalizing people. It's pushing people to violence, and it's getting worse." And he says. Thank you for your feedback. As what Vijay says, thank you for your feedback. If I'm gonna look at what, what Facebook does, what the venture capital does, the hundreds of millions of dollars sunk into BuzzFeed, Vox, Vice, to see how insane it made people, and then I can sit down next to that CEO and say, stop, this is what you're doing. And then he goes, maybe we were a bit too aggressive in how we were handling these issues. Thank you for your feedback, and then nothing changes? Perhaps the only thing you can do is disengage. Let me, let me say this. No matter what content I make, where I'm like, hey, maybe we should kind of chill out and not be authoritarian, right? 
they will use everything you say as fuel for their fire. So maybe the only thing you can do is disengage. Yeah. And, and then misquote and then lie about you. That's why every interview that everyone and anyone ever wants to do with me, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to record a portion of it. I'm going to make sure it's not edited. And of course, they always say no, they don't want to do that. But my last question is who's responsible here? The person viewing the car wreck and being entrapped to look at the car wreck or the big social media institutions or maybe even a more sinister organized. Is this, no, no. Is this maybe because there's three train of thoughts here. One, it's driven by profit. Uh, two, it's driven by some kind of conspiracy or deeper, uh, deeper kind of agenda by powerful people. Or three, it's just natural human weaknesses that they see a car wreck, they're going to want to look at the car wreck. What do you think it is? One, two, or three? Well, neither. It's, okay. it's, it's nobody's fault. This is just a system that was built and it's following the tracks that it was placed on. Should the government step up and start regulating and saying these things are making people go insane? I think yes. I am, I am, I am for regulation. I don't know what, it, what form it will take or how it will work. But look, this is an addiction. We, we've seen, there was a study from the University of Missouri showing that Twitter amplifies extremism. It's making people go crazy. It really, really is. They're lying on purpose to get those clicks, to get those likes and shares. All these big companies are making money off it. Is it the fault of the social media company that knows this? Twitter knows this and they won't do anything about it? It's their fault too. We're all sitting here. We know what's happening, but everyone's addicted to it. And I think someone needs to stand up and say, like, I, I, hey, Jack Dorsey. He should, you, you should say, you know what, we're going to get rid of these numbers because it's making people lose their goddamn minds. Yeah. But they don't want to lose their money, they don't want to lose their value. Somebody has to stand up and say, this is, this is a bad thing. It is a bad thing. Fake, fake news, or what's it saying? The lie travels halfway, halfway around the world before the truth traps, straps on its boots. And when you look at social media, take that adage and put it to social media, you are going to have ten times the fake news than you're going to have real news. It's gone insane. And so you know what my thing is? I'm going to disengage. I'm going to, I'm going to go make some videos that are going to be re remarkably less political and I'm going to focus more on on the ground stories from real people, real stores, how politics are affecting them and stay away from the insanity that's online. Yeah. Because in my opinion, I think uh, people are not as engaged, people don't hate each other, people don't want to fight as uh, is being portrayed on the line. I think there's a big difference between what happens in real life and what happens online with the majority of people actually not giving a damn. That's my opinion. I also think it's a combination of all those three. We disagree, but that's fine. And me and Tim have disagreed on many things, but we've been friends for a while. So uh, definitely appreciate you, Tim. Thanks for all the hard work work you're doing check out Tim's channel he has like five of them now he's doing like 20 videos a day <laughs> he's really busting his butt check out all his work the links will of course will be in the description and what do you guys think is it answer one two or three I would love to have this discussion down in the comment section below love to hear your feedback stay tuned for more here on independent media on wearechange.org